Hi guys, it's Minx here. Welcome back to some more Corpse Party Blood Drive. Today we're going to play Chapter 7. And, um, from what I understand from Mr. Manley, this is very much a story based chapter where a lot of exposition is going to happen. So I'm preparing myself for that, for the long read, as it were. Let's begin. Determination. This game being better than Undertale fills me with determination. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. The sounds of fire trucks and patrol cars echo through the streets. The sky was dark, the air stale, and many strong cold gusts of wind bore mass amounts of dust and debris. I didn't envy the reporter, her job as she seemed mere moments from being blown off her feet. But to her credit, she persevered. Behind her, there was a black shadow of an old man. I'm here reporting on what's been dubbed the Nationwide Ghost Disaster State, which local representatives claim is now in effect as of last night. This string of unexplained and potentially unexplainable deaths been plaguing the city presently shows no signs of letting up. Suspicious and sudden demises, homicides with unknown motives and reports of paranormal visitations are all increasing at an alarming rate. The police forces in each prefecture are still weighing their options for dealing with this issue, and few have made any official statements thus far, frustratingly. The old man's shadow in the background began acting strangely, jumping in place and making various other aimless motions. The Metropolitan Police, meanwhile, has suggested that all locals travel to a safe location in groups of three or more as soon as possible, remaining indoors until further notice. The sudden devastating appearance of the Black Pillars throughout Japan last night has also led the MUT to declare a state of emergency, setting up disaster shelters and lookouts. Official word from local bureaus on how these pillars are affecting traffic, the status of damage to the rivers, as well as countermeasures being taken can be seen here. Experts have analysed the pillars' composition and concluded that they're made of previously unknown material. They tossed around names like Spirit Matter and Entity Wall. Due to their rapid growth and the complete inability of even seismographs to predict where they may spawn, the number of casualties is quite high and global tensions are even higher. Everything up to including industrial cutters and blades has been employed in the attempt to cut through these objects, but with absolutely no effect. The Ministry of Defence is using a JSDF data to explore the strong possibility that these pillars are related in some way to the aerial sphere that hovered in our skies only days ago. I have here a list of newly appointed relief shelters, so if you live in one of the designated evacuation areas, please take note of the information on your screen. This information is available on our website and through our mobile app. But do note that any gymnasiums and schools shown in white are full, so you'll need to look elsewhere. We strongly recommend that you proceed to the nearest open facility as soon as possible. But if these things can sprout up anywhere without warning and give you no time to escape, evacuation is meaningless. There's not a damn thing anybody can do to stay safe. Whether you die or not is just dumb luck. When the hell are the police going to get off their asses and make a statement? Are they scared of public outcry? Are they hiding something? The middle Asian announcer was yelling at the top of his lungs and in an absolute frenzy. He kicked his studio desk to the ground. A black shadow of a woman could be seen behind him. Class rep. Shinazaki. Ayumi. Shinazaki. Huh? It's the ghost of everyone that died the first time round. Everyone else is dead now though too, so you know. Thank you for bringing us back to life. You mean I did it? But a whole lot more people have died now. Huh? The room grew dark and each of the four figures who stood before me slowly melted into blackness, becoming indistinct silhouettes. Even Machida, Nakashima and Kishinuma have died. So many people. Gone. What's this? Even we haven't actually been revived, huh? What was it you were trying to do again, Ayumi? No. No! I screamed and looked up. It was just a dream. I was at home watching TV. Why are you at home watching TV? Why the fuck aren't you doing something? I scrunched myself up again, putting my face to my knees. Bring them back. Bring them back. I was like a broken record with that. But it was doomed idea from the start. 
Everything I've done has been pointless. So what do I do now? I thought I could revive them, I really did. I mean, if I can come back from Yoshi's house despite those injuries and losing my sister, then anybody should be able to come back. I raise my face from my knees, eyes red and burning. And then as if I hadn't already had enough tragedy in my life, I had a loud crash just outside my house. It was the unmistakable... I thought that was in my room, by the way. It was the sound of a car wreck, and a rather severe one at that. The car's alarm was going off, but I was trying my best to ignore it. I didn't need this right now, so I simply wasn't going to bother with it. Sis, what do I do? Sis! Sis. Up next, we've learned the CEO of PL Promotions Co. Inc. is among those who've gone missing. Oh, I guess we are playing. Shinazaki Residence, the hallway. I need to go to the front door. That look of determination there. The car I'm outside was still going off, and it was getting harder and harder to ignore it by the second. Someone's ringing the doorbell a lot. What? Who's? Whoever was ringing my doorbell was really, really persistent. The irregular sound brought me back to reality. I crept over to the peephole and silently looked through it to see who'd be visiting me at this hour. On the other side of the door stood a man I didn't recognise. He had short hair and was pressing the chime frantically, as if his life depended on it. Who is that? I was kind of creeped out. I really shouldn't open the door. I moved away from the peephole. The persistent ringing continued for a bit, but then finally, thankfully, came to an abrupt halt. I slowly crept back to the peephole and took another look. The man was still there. He was just pacing back and forth in place, in front of a house that, for all he knew, had no occupants. After another short while, he approached the door again and immediately put his eye right up to the outside of the peephole. If I move now, he'd totally know I'm here. The man moved his head around but quickly replaced it with his finger, which he swirled around and round inside the tight space, as if trying to reach my eye or poke it out. Then he stepped away from the door. I could have taken this opportunity to slowly move away from the peephole, but I was oddly transfixed. Thank God. Now all he has to do is leave. Of course, the second I thought that, he came back to the door yet again. And yet again, he skipped the doorbell and went straight for the peephole. What does he want? Why isn't he saying anything? This is really creeping me out. Well, fine then. I'll just open the door and give him a piece of my mind. I grabbed the doorknob and was moments away from following through with that plan, when suddenly... Ayumi... <gasps> Sachiko? Don't open it. What? He's dead. Sachiko... I slowly turned to look at her. The Nirvana is the world of the dead. And that world is coming here. Then there was an oddly familiar sound, another car accident, again right outside my door. This time I looked outside through the peephole and saw the man from earlier sandwiched between a car and the wall of one of the houses across the street. He was absolutely mangled. But after only a few moments the man's corpse disappeared leaving nothing but a shadow in its place on the wall and ground alike a black stain. What is this? What's happening to the world? Not that I even really had to ask. Is this from breaking down the walls of the Nirvana? I wasn't just asking myself. I was asking Sachiko, whose presence still remained just behind my back. It obviously fucking is. We, we've established this as a key plot point. Like, a load. Like, this is... This is so fucking obvious. Ayumi, please, just... 
Jesus Christ, stop being so fucking dumb. Why aren't you trying to do something? Why are you watching TV at home? Why are you even at your fucking house? But she looked up at me with sad eyes. That person just now was one of the deceased. And if he turned into a black stain, then... No, it couldn't be. I pulled my smartphone from my pocket and forced myself to remain calm enough to access the photo, but then just stopped and stared. God, no. They're all black faces on the photograph, right apart from her. The photo displayed on my phone, which was now on the floor. No longer had just my friends from before with blacked out faces, but Machida, Nakashima, and Kishinuma as well. Yep, just her left. I pounded the floor with both hands and shuddered violently. You saw them die! We have established they died! Thou shalt repent. Oh. The end of the world is nigh. Oh. God shall not forgive those who are unclean and indiscreet. Oh. Some cultist group was speaking on TV. I guess the news must have ended at some point when I wasn't paying attention. The end of the world, huh? This time, I was just plain talking to myself. Um, what the fuck are you doing here? That's right, the end. Who'd ever thought the last remaining Gagora could have ended... Who could have had enough... That's right, the end. Who'd ever thought the last remaining Gagora could have enough suicide bomber determination to dream up something like this? Megari appeared in my hallway. I had no idea how long she'd been there nor how she'd gotten in, or how the fuck she's alive. I noticed she still had her heels on, though. And nothing else. I stood up, and Sachiko was as well, waiting in the wings behind me. I came back with the Ever After Stones, used them in mid-air while I was falling down the bell tower. Heavenly Host is totally destroyed, though, so these are just plain, ordinary stones now. To demonstrate, Megari snapped the two together. Nirvana, I summoned the dead. See? Probably flinched, but she was right. Nothing happened. Within the next few hours, this world will be totally blanketed in chaos. It's going to be the new land of the dead. Sucks, huh? This is seriously the cataclysm. And to top it off, that's my order on TV there. Fucking shameless, aren't they? Even I've got to draw the line at that point. She pulled back her chin and flashed me a strained smile. Oh yeah, your parents went crazy and joined, so you know. This day couldn't have been much worse for me. Are you okay, leaving things like this then? Megari wasn't mincing her words, it seemed. Oh, Jesus Christ, look at me. I held my head in both hands and looked down at the ground. If you feel responsible, come with me for a bit. I have something to discuss with you, about your bloodline. Megari approached me and grabbed my arm. Sachiko, still right behind me, began to growl like a guard dog. Get your hands off me! I can't even save my friends. I can't do anything! I don't know what the hell difference the blood of Shinazaki is supposed to make, but I'm just Ayumi, and Ayumi is worthless. Besides, the person who first introduced the Nirvana to this world was Yoshi, not me. I screamed as loudly and fiercely as I could. I didn't do anything wrong. I closed my eyes and cried the hardest I've ever cried, sobbing so intensely that I found myself nearly hyperventilating. Well done. Megari, I don't like you, but you fucking needed to do that. You're one stubborn bitch, you know that? Got a hell of an ego, too. For once in your life, just suck it up. I held my cheek and continued sobbing. Megari was looking down on me with contempt in her eyes, but also a certain intensity, which seemed more akin to desperation than anything. Are you Mishinazaki? Here's one fact you should know. Once the seventh pillar... <laughs> The Sephirot of Knowledge starts up. It's all over. The end of the world is carved in stone. However, Megari closed in on me as if our lips were about to touch. Sachiko growled again, but Megari was clearly not intimidated in the slightest. The Book of Shadows isn't gone yet. What? You came in contact with the original book, so since you draw the blood of the Shinazaki, you may yet be able to fight Misuto. I was still hesitating, and Megari apparently didn't much like that. 
God, just come the fuck on! Suddenly, Megari was pulling up the top of my uniform. My plump white stomach was now fully exposed. That piece of shit book is right here. She pointed to a spot just below my belly button. What? As she did so, my stomach started growling with an unearthly roar and shifted in place slightly. It was almost like there was a snake slithering around inside of me. Sure would have been nice if you noticed that little sooner. That thing's been sleeping inside you since you first used its power in the basement of Yoshi Shinazaki's estate. Megari crossed her arms and snorted. Of course, it's only a container. Nothing in it right now. <laughs> Growling like a cocky bastard. The growl that came from within my own body sounded like that of a wild beast. There's no way. Is this for real? I was actually tricked pretty good. Originally, the Elders sent me to support you in your efforts to obtain the Book of Shadows from that other realm, among other things. Okay. But of course, that still means I was planning on stealing it from you as soon as you got your hands on it. Now though, that doesn't matter. If the world's going to pop, there's not really any meaning in becoming the heir to the Martubas anymore, is there? And that just fucking sucks. It all goes back to Misuto. Misuto. It's that little fucker thinks he's won the war. He's got another thing coming. Don't you just want to slaughter him like a pig right now? You should stop being such a pussy and look at all the things you're capable of. There'll be time enough to abandon all your potential after you're dead. My eyes began to well up yet again. Are you saying there's still something I can do? Megara's expression turned deathly serious. Do whatever you can to bring that Book of Shadows out your body and gain control over it. If the book recognises your determination, it should extract itself naturally. And if you have the power of the book at your disposal, it'll lead the way right back into Misuto's Nirvana. I could only stare incredulously at my abdomen. Megari took this opportunity to my open my front door again to illustrate her point. Outside, the weather was still completely anomalous, with hurricane-like winds and debris clouds everywhere. The clouds up above, too, were moving abnormally fast through a disconcertingly blood-red sky. Every few seconds, a sound not unlike a spark plug firing could be heard echoing from the distance, as another black flame ignited and burned itself out in some random spot. I mean, you're going to lie down and die with this world either way, so what have you got to lose? Show me how tough you are while you've still got the chance. Just remember, the book was born from black magic. It adores cruelty and blood. With those parting words, Megari disappeared into the city. The sounds of her heels clacking softer and softer until they were no longer audible at all. Sachiko and I could do nothing but see her off. The entire nation was now plagued with entity walls and black silhouette like spirits of the dead. The entity walls were rapidly destroying schools, downtown bypasses and other crucial traffic cornerstones, and even rescue shelters creating countless new casualties by the minute. People were running into the streets, panicked and confused, and almost certainly not much longer for this earth. Where are we supposed to go? It doesn't matter, just run or you'll be crushed! What about overseas? How are you going to get there with the sky and the ocean both screwed up? Meanwhile, in Miss Kwan's office, the black-suited agents watched in horror as each TV monitor displayed a feed from a different news network across the world, and the story was exactly the same on all of them. Boss, what are we supposed to do? How is a book supposed to recognise my determination? What the hell am I supposed to do? So, how do I show this book my determination? Oh, it adores cruelty. Do we cut ourselves? Okay, no reason to go upstairs. I guess this is the room. There's a save button here, I probably should use that. There is a blade here. Sis, give me strength. In front of the mirror, dresser sat Hinoe's Zodiac Dagger. I gripped it in terror, closed my eyes, and started shaking. Do whatever you can to bring the Book of Shadows out your body and gain control over it. Just remember, the book was born from black magic. It adores cruelty and blood. 
I couldn't back down now. I lifted the dagger in front of me, poised to plunge into my body and carve myself open as samurai once did in the ritualistic suicide called seppuku. But I couldn't go through with it. I was too scared of death, too scared of the pain. I can't. I can't! The face that reflected back at me in the mirror was twisted with fear. I didn't even recognise myself. But I could see in those eyes all the weight that had been put on my shoulders, all the responsibility I'd been forced to bear. I'm a coward. I'm small and weak. The world doesn't need me. I won't be missed. But I can make a difference here and now. Ah! My mind was made up. I lifted the dagger again. Only to bring it halfway to its destination before halting its descent once more. No matter how determined I was, no matter how strong my conviction, this was literally suicide. I knew what had to be done, but knowing and accepting are two different things. I began crying like a baby. This was the most afraid I'd ever been in my entire life, and almost certainly the most afraid I ever would be. At this point, the only way I'd be able to go through with it was to clear my mind and let my arms make the motions automatically. And before I knew it, that's exactly what I did. Jesus. It's most likely I wasn't thinking about it, or anything else for that matter, that the dagger found absolutely no resistance. It was like applying excess force to slice a cake. For a very brief moment I felt nothing, but then the convulsion started, first in my abdomen, then quickly spreading up the rest of my body. My abdomen was now spasming and constricting involuntarily. And the rest of me wasn't faring much better. My entire body was in total chaos. Jesus. The extent of my agony I felt at that moment was absolutely impossible to convey. It was all-encompassing. I was utterly incapable of focusing on anything else. My lower body was spewing bright red blood, thick black blood, and an unknown yellow substance, all of which were blending together into a slurry that was, at its core, my life essence. Ugh. This went far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. The sheer shock of it rendered my body a mind jumble that I simply could not untangle. I knew there was a reason I'd done this to myself, something I absolutely had to do, and it was crucial, but regaining through cognitive function to do it would be a challenge. I can't do this. To cut across yet and remove the book, there's no way. My head was swimming as I tried beyond all reasonable measure to hang on to consciousness, just long enough to complete the task at hand. I could see my face in the mirror, but only just, as the blood that had been spurting from my abdomen had largely glazed it over. It was truly frightful sight, comparable if not to more dis comparable if not more disturbing than anything I'd seen in Heavenly Host. I can't do it. I felt feeble, helpless, and the face in the mirror was smiling at me for it, darkly, obscenely. You can't do it. Jet black crows flew by outside the window. And in that moment, a fire sparked within me. Feeling oddly resolute, I gripped the dagger, jutting out from my abdomen. And yanked it to the side with every last bit of strength I had left in me. The spray of blood gushing at me became almost exponentially more violent. Most surprisingly, it seemed like equal amounts of blood were rushing to my brain as well, as the effect was feeling like the blood vessels in my head were on the verge of bursting. But just as I felt like I was moments from my final blackout, I saw something. There, among my own entrails on the ground, was a blood-drenched tome. It was the Book of Shadows, without a question. My vision blurred from the intense loss of blood and even more intense pain. I fell forward, unable to maintain any semblance of balance any longer. And I landed right on it. With a loud, warm and unpleasant splash, my face planted firmly onto the book which was steaming in the, under the odd temperature differentials of my viscera. I awoke with a start. I was still in Hanoi's room. Indistinctively and frantically, I looked down at my abdomen. There I saw a scar resembling the ones I almost died from during the blowback at Yoshi Senazaki's house, runic lettering and all. But that was it. The bleeding had stopped. In fact, there was no blood anywhere in the room. And on the floor in front of me sat the Book of Shadows. Not a copy, but the original. This is... I slowly touched it, and from behind me Sajiko spoke. The book has acknowledged you as its owner. She was staring at me with a docile, almost reverent look in her eyes. I picked up the book and I looked at it, fear and awe running through my now clear head. 
It grumbled a bit, darting its eyes back and forth. Eventually it seemed to settle on a specific direction, looking, locking its gaze. It seemed to be looking out the window. What is that? Most likely the entrance to Nirvana. Wait, Kisaragi Academy is in that direction. I guess we're going to the Nirvana, guys. Dad, Mum, thank goodness. I was worried sick about... The world has ended. The world has ended. Dad, Mum... Can we leave? Shouldn't we just be going to Kisaragi Academy with the Book of Shadows? I'll be back for you, I swear. And then they both died. What the fuck? Are we like halfway through the game or some shit? Let's see. Only I and me can save everyone as we move into the final, I think, like, three, four chapters. Let's see what happens next! Alright! Sachiko, I can't believe I'm saying this, but having you by my side is kind of reassuring. Sachiko looked at me with sweet, innocent eyes. When I arrived at Kisiragi Academy, I got a much better look at the phenomenon. It was like a whirlpool with a red, dully shining hole in its centre. Was this the entrance to the Ever After? Beyond that is the Nirvana. Kinetic magic? Like how witches fly? No way! I closed my eyes, clasped the Book of Shadows tightly in both hands, and prayed. Book of Shadows, lend me strength! When I opened my eyes again and looked up into the sky, my body began to float. I was in control of the Book of Shadows. I was a legitimate practitioner of magic now. The moment felt like an awakening to endless new possibilities. I'm actually flying? Wow! Wow! I'm right next to me, flying by my side with Sachiko. Ayumi? 
Huh? The momentary loss of focus dropped me out of my trance and I immediately began falling. I gripped the book even tighter and concentrated harder than before, and sure enough I began rising up towards the vortex once more. Be careful, Amy. It's the book that's allowing you to use these powers. You mustn't let go of it. Understood. No, it's like Mary Poppins with more death. As I flew higher, I could see Megari sitting on the roof of the skull. Looks like you managed to gain control of the Book of Shadows after all. I underestimated you, Ayumi Shinazaki. You even installed an escalator from Kisaragi Academy right up to Nirvana. Not too shabby. There is one more thing you could probably know, though. The Nirvana's encroachment upon us and direct connection to this world isn't really your fault at all. The very moment that the Heavenly Host Nirvana first appeared in this world... No, even further back, at the moment when the Book of Shadows was first created, the coming of this apocalypse was basically an inevitability. I looked into Magari's face. She was completely sincere. The former owners of that book, including Yoshi Shinazaki, all tried desperately to stop it, or at least slow it down. And when they learned they couldn't, they left the fate to the next generation instead. That's why the book continued to be handed down through the ages. I see. What that means is, this all would happen anyway, with or without you. Save for one thing. Your actions resulted in the power of the Nirvana being handed over to Misuto, the surviving member of that fucked up Yagura cult. And you do need to take responsibility for that. Responsibility. You have the real Book of Shadows, but all the power of the Nirvana, broken up and distributed through Heavenly Host, has been absorbed by Misuto's fake book. If you can get it back and seal it in that one, you can easily outclass him. And if you can go one step further, taking in the Nirvana's core, then that book will be complete. Now is the time to strike. Go in there and fuck him up. Before the world ends, let's see what real power tastes like. I'll be watching. McGrory grew smaller as I climbed higher and higher, and as I looked up, I could see the threshold loom me even larger, poised as if to wrap itself around me. Are you me? Huh? Are you scared? Well, you should be, because this is all a prank! Ah! Are you scared of dying? I don't know. Am I? I smiled at her, and to my surprise, it was a genuine smile. Somehow or another, I was feeling very calm. Sajiko looked at me with wide eyes. What's wrong? She turned away briefly, then looked at me once more. It almost seemed like in that brief moment she changed expressions, in much the way someone would change a suit. Ayumi, what you should be scared of is Sachi, and the person in the Nirvana's core. Don't let your guard down. The person in the Nirvana's core? It isn't Masuto? Oh, yeah. There's someone else. I looked back to then find myself practically right on top of the hole in the sky that stood in front of the abnormally huge red moon. And with my conviction settled, I jumped in. The harsh flash, the nausea, and the wrenching tightness in my chest caused me to lose consciousness for a second. But then I awoke to find that heaven and earth had switched places. It looked as though I was falling headfirst into a massive storm with flashing lightning and roaring thunder. It almost seemed like I was previewing what the world would look after its destruction. In the sky, there was an enormous face of a doll, and the walls around me were all made of flesh. Lovely. That was lovely, wasn't it, guys? Nice. I clenched the Book of Shadows with both hands as I slowly made my landing in this new version of the Nirvana. It was a mountain of rubble. What is this? Everything is broken to bits. Ah, what the hell? Ayumi, are you okay? Yeah, I can handle this much at least. I did stab myself. I slowly carefully found my footing and pulled myself back up to my feet. This was an entirely different heavenly host. It bore absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to any of the version of the school we had traversed pre previously. Heavenly host elementary turned into this? Where are the others? Machida, Nakashima, Kishinuma, Miss Kwan, Aiko! I called out to my friends but received no answer. All I could hear was the rumbling and twisting of the air around me. There was no mistaking it. 
In the midst of the wreckage, pieces of clothing from Kishinuma, Machida, Nakashima, Miss Kwan and Aiko were clearly visible. And the unfortunate souls who were wearing the clothes were all buried under fallen beams and other debris, and surrounded by a veritable sea of blood. I knelt down and began sobbing uncontrollably. You guys... Misuto, show yourself. What you've done is unforgivable. Sachiko stared at me as, con as I continued to scream and cry. Ayumi? What is it, Sachiko? I'll see what I can do. I can try and restore Heavenly Host Elementary's destiny. At least some small part of it. What? Sachiko produced a Calavera necklace from her pocket. The skeletal figure on the chain made a slight hollow clinking sound as it was handled. Very much as an actual bone would. It looked handmade and seemed oddly warm, like a keepsake. What is that? I had this weird feeling that I'd seen this object somewhere before. I swear that looks familiar, but from where? <laughs> Though she looked down at the ground a bit slightly guilty and slightly guarded, Sajiko giggled slightly. This is my treasure. A big smile crept across her lips, and for a moment she looked every part of an ordinary little girl. I was confused. Sajiko placed a hand on the Book of Shadows. Fat loop. And the book spoke. Repeat the same day. Followed by Sachiko. We're going back in time? Suddenly I was in Yoshi Shinazaki's clinic. The very same clinic Nakashima and I visited on that fateful day. This person is Yoshi. I was viewing Sachiko's memory in an event from long ago. Yoshi was writing something in her journal. I've analysed the anagrams and determined that all the spells written in this book are nothing more than theories. Not one of them has ever been properly tested. There are no success rates. There's no data of any kind. So why would I was naive enough to attempt something so foolish? I devoted everything I have to my blood, my soul, to an end that was destined never to succeed in the first place. And now that spells failed and Levan has escaped from the book, I've created a whole other dimension. Worst of all, the deceased who become trapped in that dimension are erased from existence in our world. Sachiko came into the room from the back. Her eyes met with Yoshi's and she smiled. However, since I was able to suppress the strain of Anna, Sachiko stood obediently by her mother, wearing the white dress we'd seen her in in Heavenly Host. Yoshi patted her on the head approvingly. Sachiko then coughed up a fine black mist, but sucked it back into her mouth like a carp. I could at least rescue one person's existence from that shadowy, forgotten fate. The face on the image was blackened out like those of Psycho and the others. However, to my surprise, the black marking was slowly peeling itself away, revealing the features underneath. What the fuck is going on? My vision slowly cleared, and when it did, amidst all the rumbling and shaking, I found myself back in Heavenly Host Elementary. Oh. Then promptly, Sachiko collapsed on the ground. Sachiko! Without thinking, I picked her up and held her limp, light body in my arms. She must have used up her spirit energy as she was clearly drained. She was breathing, but only very lightly. She's dead! Poor girl seemed to be in pain. Wait, am I actually holding Sachiko? Sachiko was real. She had to have been, or I wouldn't have been able to hold her onto her like this. She seemed injured, but not in any traditional manner. There were cracks running through her body, each one emanating an earthly blue, almost gaseous light. Meanwhile, the school itself was also cracking and breaking all around me, making an incredible noise. The roof above began to crumble away, providing glimpses of the real world. And incredibly, the entity walls hadn't spawned there yet. We're back. This is before everyone died! Sajiko, hang in there! Oh, Yumi, I'm sorry, I couldn't revert more time. No, Sajiko, thank you. That was amazing, you did great! I could hardly believe it. I just, compl I just complimented Sajiko, of all people, on a job well done. You're praising me? Her newly formed physical body was rapidly beginning to evaporate into mist. My voice was trembling, and though I suspect it was less with fear, and more with confusion. Yes, that was incredible. You're a good girl, Sachiko. She looked up into the sky, eyes beginning to well with tears. She was struggling to speak soon. She wouldn't be able to at all. I wanted to apologize. 
What? She barely had any voice left, but was persevering nonetheless. This was clearly something she didn't want to leave unsaid, no matter what. I know you can never forgive me, but I wanted to apologize anyway. And with that, she began full on crying. Sajiko! I couldn't help doing the same. I killed a lot of people. I'm not a good girl. You shouldn't praise someone like me. The tears were streaming down my face now. Sachiko's voice was so mournful, so genuine. But you just saved a lot of people now too. So thank you. A massive earthquake shook the ground. Sachiko looked scared, so I patted her head and hugged her tightly. She then looked at me squarely in the eye, gripping her Calavera necklace tightly in her hand, as if it were rosary. It's strange, isn't it? What is? Once you know you did right, passing on isn't so scary anymore. Sachiko. Ah! Sachiko and the blue light alike both disappeared completely. She was gone. The, beginning, the being I was hugging moments ago no longer existed. All I could do was clench my fists and mourn. The look on Sachiko's face when she asked if I was scared of dying kept flashing through my head. Sachiko, you were the one who was scared, weren't you? I kept my head hung low for a moment and stood up and wiped the tears from my eyes. Accompanying the sound of rumbling, one single entity wall now stood in the real world. The cycle was beginning anew. Watch over me, Sachiko. One Shinazaki to another. Let's stop that cunt. Oh, fuck me. Praise. Good girl. Unfair. Sachiko. Well, that's fucking great. 10 out of 10, best sister ever. And that's the end of the chapter, holy shit. Hope you enjoyed this act of Corpse Party Blood Drive, guys. Next time there's going to be more Corpse Party Blood Drive, and I guess we'll find out who really is in the core and stuff. I'm quite intrigued by that. Sash is obviously going to play more of a part. It's kind of exciting. Yes, I do want to save. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Let me know what you thought of the series so far in the comments. I'll see you really fucking soon. Have a great fucking day, everyone. Bye for now. Bye for now.